Alrighty. I think we're going to get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to PMP Live. My name is Margaret Orto, and I'm the events coordinator here at Politics and Prose in the Children and Teens Department. Thank you so much for joining us today for a conversation with actor, model, UN Goodwill Ambassador, and now author, Gare Duane and Jeffrey Gettleman, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist currently with the New York Times in partnership with Peace Studio. We are here to celebrate the publication of Walk Toward the Rising Sun, From Child Soldier to Ambassador of Peace. In this powerful coming of age memoir, Duane recounts his journey from a child soldier recruited into Sudan's North-South Civil War to his arrival in America as a teen suffering PTSD to his eventual careers as actor, model, and peace ambassador. A few items before we get started on our conversation. Walk Toward the Rising Sun is available for purchase on our website. We'll also drop the book purchase link into the chat during this conversation. Please note that we're offering signed book plates with book purchase while supplies last. This afternoon, you can ask a question by clicking Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. If time allows at the end of our conversation, we will get to a few audience questions. As always, please remember, this is a creative safe space and we ask that attendees be respectful of one another in any questions and comments. Also, there are a few tickets left in our special post-event meet and greet with, uh, with Gare Duane that will begin about 10 minutes after we finish this public event. If you'd like to join us for this meet and greet and ask your own question of Gare, you can still do so. We'll put the registration link into the chat, or you can register through Eventbrite again at the same link used to enter this public event, but this time you would register for the add-on special VIP event. A book purchase is required for this special meet and greet. Uh, anybody who joins uh, the meet and greet will have their book signed as well as personalized. Uh, Politics and Prose is thrilled to partner on this event with the Peace Studio, a nonprofit that supports artists, journalists, and storytellers as active peace builders. The event will open with messages from two special guests today and later include a musical interlude inspired by Duane's mem memoir performed by classical guitarist Alberta Corey. This musical interlude is also a part of the Peace Studio's 100 Offerings of Peace campaign, which commissions creatives to generate new works about what peace means to them for online viewing between July 1 and November 1, 2020. So now I'm going to share the special messages. Um, and then after the messages, uh, the conversation will begin. Hi, my name is uh, Philippe. I'll always remember the first time I saw Gare. It was during the auditions for the movie, The Good Lie, about the refugees from South Sudan. Here came this like tall, handsome guy, calm yet charismatic beyond belief. We knew right away we wanted him to play a role in the movie, not only for his skills as an actor, but also because of his humanistic aura. There was something about Gare's presence that reminded me of uh, uh, a calm ocean. It was, he was soothing, yet very powerful. Um, Gare quickly became my guide uh, to navigate the complex details and issue of South Sudanese uh, culture and, and politics. And um, I had visited his war-stricken country in, uh, in 94. I was a young man back then and Gare probably just a kid. And so we used to joke that our paths probably crossed before we met officially. So, Gare, my brother, I wish you a long life for everyone's sake, and good luck with your beautiful book. Gare's story is incredible, and I'm thrilled to see that he's sharing it with the world. I first met Gare when I was working for UNHCR, the World Refugee Agency, 
and I was really moved the first time I heard his story from him. He fled Sudan as a lost boy, and since then he seized every opportunity to use this platform to empower young refugees to give back and to give hope. Gare, you once said, quote, given a chance, refugee kids excel. They're not powerless. They don't need pity. They can be citizens of any country, respectfully and constructively contributing to humanity's goals. And you are an embodiment of these words and you are living this vision. Thank you for constantly inspiring us, Gare. My heartfelt congratulations and best wishes to you on your book. Okay. Um, now um, I'm, we're ready to get started with our in conversation and I'm delighted to introduce Jeffrey Gettleman who will be in conversation with Gair today. Uh, he is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for international reporting and currently the New York Times' South Asia Bureau Chief based in New Delhi. Previously, he was the East Africa Bureau Chief based in Kenya from 2006 to 2017. He is the author of Love of Africa, a memoir about his experiences there. And so now I turn it over to Jeffrey and Gair. Take it away. Gair, <clears throat> Mali. I, th I think, Gair, is your microphone uh, on mute? Can you hear me? Let me start. Let me let me take it from the top. Mali. Mali Muga. Mali my name. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's good to see you, man. <laughs> it's an honor to uh, to be here with you. Your your book is beautiful, and you've been through so much. And I um, just finished the book with like deep, deep respect for everything you have been through and what you've done with your life. So I've heard a lot about you before. This is the first time we've actually talked, and. I want to congratulate you and um, just share a lot of enthusiasm for a beautiful book. Well, well, well thank you so much uh, for having me here. Uh, I mean, it is my pleasure to share with you today time and ideas. And, uh, and for those who don't know me, my name is Gare Duane. Uh, I wore yeah, many hats, acting, modeling, activism, and now an author, something that I got to get used to saying. And um, <clears throat> my memoir, Walk Toward the Rising Sun, uh, is have a lot of meanings in itself because the sun is what gives me hope. It's my guidance to really find a place where I can live with people in association. Uh, but, uh, and I've been trying to share my life story with a lot of people uh, all over the world, like Melissa say and, and Philippe. But something happened last year. Uh, you know, I had an honor to work with an incredible people. Uh, my co-writer, uh, author herself, uh, Garen Thomas, came and helped me, you know, unpackage raw and unfiltered materials to bring my life journey to life. And I'm very pleased with the outcome. And, and I think a lot of people will really enjoy it, you know, because I literally went out there, Jeff, to open my heart, you know. And, and I'm very happy to be here talking with you. And actually, I'm a huge fan of your work because you've been in East Africa and you know how volatile the area was in the 90s. Yeah, no, I, in reading your book, I remembered a lot. <clears throat> I covered some of those events, you know, the independence of South Sudan, the Civil War. Um, let's start with this, Gare. I mean, th there's so much I want to talk to you about, but let, let's start with this. What, what you, you've had so many different experiences. You've, you've survived narrowly uh, being killed several times. Uh, you've watched your family self-destruct around you, uh, which was some of the saddest parts of your book. Um, you really struggled when you got to the US. Uh, you, you know, you've, you've lived a very rich life. Um, what made you wanna to take on writing a memoir? Well, like I say, I always wanted to share my life with the world because I know I, I came from a place uh, where we never have an opportunity to learn 
or for the world to know that, you know, our people can be a huge help in things that we are doing. So for me to come to America and really live a life where I was not involved in a physical war, it gave me a motivation uh, to do more. And then I came to realize that we are more than what we've been told that we just refugees. We can actually do things that really help other people. And I think I always, I like life, man. I, I enjoy life and I like to help people. <laughs> Yes. No, that's, 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 that's clear throughout the book. Um, some, some, of the, some of the passages were so vivid. And, and, and you said, you know, you wanted to write this in a raw and unfiltered way. Um, I want to get people excited about what's in the book. And I, and I would love for you to just relive some of those moments. Um, let's, let's start with that, that first experience you had getting sucked into the war when you were a little boy and all the tranquility and normality that you had lived was shattered in an instant when your village was attacked. Just tell us about what that, what did that look like? What did that feel like? You, you know, you even talked about at some points later, you could see the soldiers that were shooting at you. Like put us there for a minute. Yes. Um, you know, my life is set on a long extended civil war between the North and South of Sudan. And then uh, the war that really affected my life the most when I was a small boy was 1983 one. You know, there's many wars that were fought before. The history is longer than that. And then uh, most of us are born in a war or run from the war, even our mothers and our fathers. So what I was gonna, what I've been trying to do is uh, in that, I know war is something being known all over the world by a lot of people. Yeah, and it's, 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 if the war didn't really happen too, I might not even learn the world, how big the world is. So it seemed like it's something that um, I need in order for me to see what's going on around the world. In 1983, when my village, uh, when we were moved to my village called Lid, and then uh, my dad did that because he thought, you know, we will be safe in a village because the rumors of the war start they, they were happenings and then he thinks if we're in a village then we would be safe and then by 1983 the war really exploded in every area and then uh, helicopters they were just all over South Sudan and then they came to my village in Lid and then they pour fire on, on everybody and our livestock and everybody has to just scatter to, to the forest so that we can find safety there and, uh, and I was a small boy and my mother was pregnant at the same time with twins, uh, both in Yandit. And then uh, and me and my brother Duen and Nyakwar, uh, we just had to hold our hands and then we were running into a forest along with a lot of villages. So that events in itself stayed with me for so long and, uh, and many more later on happened because uh, when we went to the Great Upper Nile, cause since you know the area, uh, no, that's where our cows always had to graze. Uh, so in a, in, in, in a dry season, we go there and then uh, we, we enjoy a lot of activities, uh, fishing and, and, uh, and living life, you know, while in the midst of the civil war. And, and that attack too in 1986, where we were living is called Bukteng. Uh, it's more of a SPLA headquarter and then it was being attacked because even the South Sudanese, we have two movements at the same time, they were trying to eliminate each other. So there's SPLA and there's Anyanya too. So they were fighting at the same time. They don't have the same vision, but we all need freedom in our countries so that we can really govern ourselves. So it was, it was intense battle and I was there as a child. And then uh, we were being, uh, scattered by, by, the, by, by the Anyanya too. And then uh, all of us, soldiers and, and civilians uh, had to just run together. So I was in that crossfire so much with my mother, but after we really survived that one, and then that's when we start walking toward the sun, uh, which is the location of where Ethiopia is, because there's a refugee camp 
that was established there many, many, many decades ago. And my mom was familiar with that because she lived there. And then I just followed my mom and we went. And there's a lot of masses of people that was going to Ethiopia. And that's how my life, I was introduced to refugee life in Ethiopia in 1987. Well, let me, let me just step back for a second. I, 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 as a journalist for the New York Times, was based in Kenya, uh, covering East Africa for a decade. And I care, uh, you know, a lot about the region. Um, and, and Sudan and South Sudan was, more, was among the bigger stories that I, I worked on. And the people of South Sudan, so, so just to give a little background, Sudan was the biggest country in Africa, but it always had this, this tension between the North and the South. Yes. The North identified with the Arab world, they spoke Arabic. Um, it, it was a, a different culture centered around the Nile in the Southern part of, South, of Sudan was mostly Christian, different ethnicities, different culture. And there had been tension between the two sides you know, since the, since the 1950s at least when Sudan got its independence. There were several waves of conflict that, that flared up and then simmered down and flared up and, sim and simmered down, but the, the deeper problems were never solved. The Southerners always felt like they were treated really badly by the Arabs in the North. And they were chafing for their own, their own land and for independence. And when I came to East Africa in 2006, a historic peace treaty had just been signed between the North and the South. Yes. And it set the, uh, the, the South on the track for independence, which is, which is something that South Sudanese had been fighting for for decades. Yes. But, the, but, the, but the, the pain and the suffering and the terror and the trauma that the South Sudanese have, have experienced is just, of all the conflicts I covered, there was, there was no people that had suffered so much. Um, and, and, and reading your book, it just, it just, it, it just pained me to, you know, read about what you had been through and to see sort of your whole world collapse around you and your family, you know, deal with the stress in different ways. And then you got sucked into this as a, as a combatant and, and tell us a little bit, I mean, you're now like living a totally different life. This is a, another world, uh, that existed that thankfully you escaped from, and a lot of people have escaped from. Um, but tell us, I wanna know like what it, what it was like as a kid to be carrying a gun and to, to feel this pride and this, and this vigor to get involved in the conflict. You wanted to be a soldier. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I had a phone call with my father uh, two weeks ago, and that's the first time we're speaking since since the current civil war really happened in 2013. And the last time when I saw him was 2010, uh, when, when we all went into a country so that we can now, uh, one second. Stay there, sorry. Uh, and my, my father was telling me, uh, yeah, you know, Gary, I put the gun in your hand a long time ago, and then you, you stood your ground you fight battles that you were not supposed to be fighting. And, uh, and then now you went to America and you never really, and I hope you didn't turn your back to your people where you find yourself a new society and then you just wanted to live there. <laughs> so it was his way to really tell me, you gotta come back and, um, and help us because he's become an old man and he said he fought this, for this country since he was 19 years old and now maybe he's in his seventies. Uh, I have to have my own guns. I have to have to protect my family. Uh, and that was very important at the time because we didn't have a security. Our security is our own, is our own self, our own clan, you know, and, um, and that's the reason a lot of us, the young children really joined um, SPLA with intention that when we grow, we're going we're gonna to go to war. I, my future was to go to war and really fight and fight for the independence of, of, of our people so that we can govern ourselves. And uh, it, is, it is a cause that engulf all of us. Uh, and uh, there's, no, there's no time to wait for it because we don't have other things to do other than uh, looking after your own siblings or you're looking after your livestock. So I participated in those 
in, in those things because that was my life, Jeff. I didn't have another life, you know. But something happened after I came to Ito. Uh, kind of gave me a little bit of stability. And then uh, I was introduced a little bit of refugee schools that we were attending under the tree. And then something triggered by learning. So I like to learn. And then, uh, and ever since then, uh, all of us been hungry about education because all our leaders, they always tell us, uh, once we liberate this land and then you guys will come and build it. So for us to come to America, it gave us opportunity to go to school and try to learn, but you know that you left everybody behind uh, that will need a helping hand at some point. So that's well, why- Gary, let me just know, I wanna, I wanna stop you there because I thought one of the most interesting parts of the book Okay. was your adjusting to life in the US. So millions of refugees flee these war zones across Africa every year, and they hope to get this, this essentially like a lottery ticket to be resettled in the US or in a Western country. Many don't get that. I've, you know, we've met yeah. them. They're stuck in these refugee camps for their entire lives. You yeah. look at Darfur or Somalia, you know, there's, there's, there's kids born and, and, and then you know, generations of children that are raised in these camps, that's all they ever know. But, but you got out and your passage to the U.S. was, was really was interesting and really tough. And you write, you write in your book, Americans didn't get me. I didn't get them. I became a complete recluse, never talking unless I had to. I retreated and only observed, talking to whatever I needed, taking in whatever I needed to. And in, in the U.S., in the U.S., you started going down the wrong track. You even managed to lose a job at Burger King. Um, so, <laughs> so, so tell us, but, but, but what struck me was you, you went from, from kind of lost and angry to having a really strong work ethic. Like, that's what struck me is like how hard you worked in those, you know, in those later high school and early college years. Tell us about that. Like, how, how did you hit the bottom and then how did you bring yourself up? Uh, there's so many failure in my life, Jeff, I can tell you that much. And then, uh, but I never really lose sight about what I really wanted to do. So I was get up and try to do it all over again. Yeah, when I came to the state, I, we, I didn't know anything because first I, I couldn't speak English. And in order for me to navigate in a, in a new land with new people, new faces, I have to learn how to communicate. So the faster that I can do that, the more I can really help. So the only job that I can really get at the time, you know, while I was underage, you know, just, just working at Burger King. And, uh, and when we work, we always think about those we left behind in a refugee camp because uh, some of our guys, they didn't, they had the opportunity to come, but some of them too, they failed because we have to go through a process of uh, doing medical check. And then uh, if they find you, you are positive, HIV or AIDS, and then uh, they don't allow you. And then I left a lot of guys behind for past 25, 26 years. And some of them, they're not longer with us anymore. But luckily, in my case, uh, and the group that I came with, uh, we passed. And uh, we came here, uh, we didn't know our way, and we didn't have any other people to really give us a guidance. And, uh, and we, we stuck it out. And, uh, and most of us, we don't really have stories. So the reason I really find, a, well, when I find basketball, it gave me a love for basketball is what really gave me ground. And it got me to a point where I had to get involved in America by knowing American children. And if I come here at an older age, maybe I would have never really have a story to tell you today. Yeah. And then uh, that's how I got high school, helped me understand America. And it made me make friends with American kids and I spent time with them. And we travel all across the country with the AAU basketball. And, uh, and it was something that I loved the most. And it, Give me a focus, you know. What was it like? You you also write about racism, like because you hadn't experienced that in in 
you know, in your world in, in South Sudan. And that was, that was tough for you and all the different divisions within the refugees. Um, and you come from a place that takes like a lot of pride in, in its, you know, in its identity. I mean, you start your book and as anybody who's been to your part of the world knows, you know, the, the new era do this very intense ritual scarification. Yeah, I mean, yes. it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and, you know, you barely missed it, right? Like your dad didn't think <laughs> you should do it, but you had a lot of relatives who did do it. You were right on the cusp. And, you know, those traditions are, are probably dying out. Like the number of kids that do that these days is much yeah. less than it was when we were growing up. Um, but you, you guys had a lot of pride. And, and, you know, that was like to show the world who you are. And then you get to the States and people look at you like you're weird, you're different, you're African. They don't know anything about what you've experienced, what you've survived. What was that like? Was that really frustrating? I, I mean, it's, you know, the state overwhelmed me and it fascinated me. So it doesn't really matter what a person say to me, you know. I always look beyond uh, what other people can say about me uh, when I was growing up here in America. And then, uh, yes, I, I come from that kind of background where we have to have scarifications because once you initiate it you become a man so you're not longer a boy it's like you having a license a driver license at age of 16 you are being initiated you are given responsibility you're supposed to be a responsible person not try to break law so it's the same thing that's how i really can see it <laughs> so yeah when i came here and then now uh, yeah they 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 have all the right not to know anything about me and, and I, I can't communicate myself in order for you to know what it is uh, that I went through. And also, you know, my stories are always scary and, and gripping. And I didn't want to bother to really tell a person's story. And then all of a sudden, maybe they will feel sorry for me. What I wanted to do is, is to get involved and, and educate myself just like any other American person. And I was given that opportunity just by living in an environment where I don't hear any gunshots. Or RPG explosion. So that was good enough for me, man. Uh, uh, Racism in America, yeah, I experienced that uh, with with basketball, you know. Uh, in Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana, where we're from, and then uh, we always have a rival with the Martinsville's, and then uh, we were not welcome there. And, uh, and, and that story was even covered at, at the ESPN at the time in 1998, and that was my last year in high school getting out to go to college so that's when i really get to understand uh, yes those those kind of things they really happen nothing new here and and also you know tribalism and, and i take it as like how i see tribalism in south sudan you know and racism it seems like that's parallel right there if you think about it uh, because people fight because yeah, you're from different tribes, you're from this, you're from that, you know. So it was nothing new in my end. Tell us a little bit uh, about, the, about the modeling. I mean, to go from a child <laughs> to being a fashion model. And, and I actually, I was cracking up when I was reading your book, when you were trying to tell your, your relatives back in Sudan that you were getting paid <laughs> to, wear, to wear clothes. Like, was it fun or did it feel empty? I mean, I, I detected some frustration uh, as you were reliving those moments that it just wasn't that interesting to you. Yeah, I mean, hey, I'm very grateful that I got involved in modeling as well because I met many great people there and, uh, and I learned so many things too from them. And uh, well, modeling, you know, um, when you billboard walking and then you have a message, your message is those clothes that you are wearing. <laughs> so I was wearing clothes to walk and, and, and look beautiful, you know. <laughs> That's what we have to do and we get paid for that. So I really enjoy that for that time. But I always look beyond just uh, to do only modeling because uh, it was a point where, you know, I could really communicate myself and then I have a message in my mouth. So I communicate my message first with the modeling. Uh, by walking that's how i looked at it and then it gave me a platform to speak and once i start speaking and then uh, and people start to listen sharing my sharing my story like what i'm doing right now and then they they, they start to to welcome me even more 
uh, but I have to look beyond again too because uh, I got to do more. Uh, I left a lot of people behind that I care about. And, uh, that, but I was grateful. Uh, what can I say, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think we're going to take a little break. Yeah, we'll take a moment. Um, thank you both so much. We're going to get back to, to more um, of the conversation, but I wanted to share the um, video that was done um, in honor of the publication of your memoir, Gare, um, by Alberta, Alberta Corey, um, a classical guitarist. And it'll come on screen in just a moment. Amazing. Beautiful. <sighs> yeah. So Gary, let's let's talk a little bit about South Sudan and and when you went home. I thought that scene with your with with reuniting with your mom uh, after nearly twenty years was one of the most powerful parts of the book. Um, bring us there. Tell us a little bit about how you were feeling building up to that moment, and then what it was like to to hug your mom after all those years? Yes. Well, <clears throat> in 2008, I went back to South Sudan for the first time since I left in 1993. So when I went back, we were going through the transition of, we're gonna have a comprehensive peace agreement, a chance for South Sudanese to vote if we wanna to be together or we wanna be separate. In 2008, I stay in Juba, and then my intention is to go see my mother if I can find a way. But there's a lot of sectarian killing that was happening at the same time. And uh, I still told my uncle, because I went there with my uncle and my cousin, that I grew up with them in Bloomington, Indiana, that my mother is in a cobra. There's no way that I can go to South Sudan and not get to see my mom. And when I arrived to Juba, and then uh, my uncle and other leaders within South Sudan, they decided that we're gonna to go to our village. And then uh, we went to a village where it was like another two days walk to Akobo, where I was born and raised. And, uh, and then there was a dangerous uh, area and the rain, rainy season started to take uh, place as well. So I stayed in that village for over 
eight day or nine days, something like that. And then uh, we just have to go back to Juba because there's no way that I can go. And that broke my heart. So I spent a few, few weeks in Juba and then I came back to New York. That's when uh, things start to build for me that, man, I, I gotta go back and find my mother because she's still alive, she's still around and then, um, and my father. So I worked very hard, extra hard, you know, with intention that I'm gonna go back and another two years passed and then I went back again uh, with intention to go and vote with my mother. And then I, document, I documented all of those things along with my friends who are filmmakers like Wanui, Cahill and, and Marius from South Africa. And then we finally we managed to make it through to Okobo and, and I got to see my mom and my mother could not believe that I'm the son that came out of a womb and then she cried and I cried and we just didn't know what to do with each other because all these years she thinks that I'm not alive anymore because there's no way this guy can be gone for this long as much as she knows my heart. Um, that I could never turn my back to them. Yeah. How is she um, doing now? What What is she up to now? Uh, Mom, she she died three years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in Nairobi, yeah, and uh, and we just we didn't spend a lot of time together. So I try to do the process to come to to the states along with my brothers, and then uh, she did manage. She died from the colon cancer. And uh, I had to bury her in Nairobi, Kenya. So Kenya become a second home where my mom, uh, my mom uh, is buried, you know, by me and my brothers. Yeah. I'm sorry, listen, she, she I, you know, what you did, your journey, I'm sure made her really, proud and you know you're lucky to have somebody like her you were lucky to have somebody like her strong um that's really hard i can't like it's hard for me to relate to that tell me about about your about your dad so so in the book the the last scene with your dad is he's in handcuffs in jail yes. um what happened after that well, my dad committed a murder within the family. So uh, the law had to get involved in, in Sudan where he has to go to prison uh, for the rest of his life or, or face execution because they execute people there. And then uh, and when I went back in the country with intention to go and vote, I went and looked for him. And that's the first person that I went to see in Melekal, it's a big town. Uh, maybe you are familiar because you know the area, yes. And then that's where I went to meet my father in the prison where they put the people who commit murders. And then that's the reason you see, maybe, maybe you see it in a, in a video where he was, he was in a chain. And then, uh, and then I had to take his message because uh, to the family that we have to vote he still had their focus that the, the land that he fought for, we, got it. we have to vote and we have to vote with the separations. And he sent me to Alcoba with the message. Uh, that was another moment too, you know, because I haven't seen my father in a long time. Yeah. And what's the, and, and you said you talked to him two weeks ago. What's, is he out of jail? Yes, and then uh, the case uh, was resolved in a traditional way because first they want to do it in a, uh, to constitution of South Sudan or Sudan, which is they always hang people. But because the murder was in a family, uh, the family had to do a reconciliation, all of us. So we had to resolve it uh, in a way, in a, in a newer traditional way of resolving when the death happened within a family. And uh, he was released and, uh, and my family is re reconciled and that we are back together as, as, as brothers, as our cousins. And we live together right now. So. Is there, is there, Gare, I mean, it's, it's like, 
it's like you contain so many different experiences. It's unbelievable. It's all in one in one person, you know, to have to have this the arc of your life, and you're not even that old. Um, do you want to go back? Is there part of you that that feels like you should be back helping South Sudan? I mean, I mean, it's my home, and uh, I have many homes now, and. Um, and, and and I'm very happy to have many home and many opportunity. So to go back and come back here, it's, it's, it's just, it's, a, it's not a bad thing. You know, I can always go back. I can always come back here. And that's what I've been doing for past 10 years. You know, uh, that's the reason I had a base in Nairobi. And I have siblings there. I have my family there. And, and Nairobi is a second home to, to me. Uh, just as much as America become my home for the past 26 years. Where, where in Nairobi do they live? Uh, 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 well, in Gong Hill area. Okay. Yeah. That's beautiful. Beautiful area. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah. What, what, what is your sort of, what's your dream now? Like, what do you, what do you want to do? How do it, what, what's sort of like your goals for the next few years with your life? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, would, I start my new family, so I'm gonna try to look after my own son and, and my wife and, and, this, and my other siblings. I think that would, that's, that's a good goal for me. I always wanna have a family. And, uh, and raising a child is a, is a beautiful thing. It makes me happy, you know. Uh, this journey has taken toll on me not to start a family at a very young age. So in my 40s and then I'm not young to start a new family, but I don't have a lot of dreams, man. I, yeah. So if there's peace in South Sudan, I will go back and maybe I will give a helping hand. And I like agriculture. I would love to grow my own fruits and show my son how to grow his own fruits. <laughs> uh, so it's not a lot. Of, I don't have a big dream right now. This is this is it. When you were working on your book, what were some what were some influences or inspirations of other books you had read or other stories you had had taken in that you admired and you wanted to? So you were thinking of those when you were telling your own story. Oh, that's you know, um, I'm being inspired by a lot of things. So. But while I was working on my book, because I was not really reading uh, any story that are coming out of my country, uh, because uh, it's always more, more fighting is happening. So I didn't want to write about, I didn't want to read about that suffering. So I'd rather just show up. That's the reason I go to refugee camp myself to assess the situation and, and, and see how I used to live and how my people are really living. Uh, people inspire me. I, you know, I, I, I enjoy books. A guy like Thomas Sowell and uh, his, his work is incredible. You know, A Conflict of Regions is a book that I always enjoy reading and, and the way he articulate things there. Uh, but other than that, there's, I, I go through a lot of information. I read all kinds of things randomly, even in the airport. So I don't have any things that I can say, this is what really inspired me. <laughs> I always just wanted to speak from my heart, you know. Do you stay on top of what's happening in uh, South Sudan? Are you constantly talking to people uh, I'm there, following I'm the... I'm observing. I'm observing and I'm pretty aware about what's going on. But and I, what's, I mean, just, just for, to, to let our audience know, one of the biggest problems in South Sudan is this, this conflict between the two biggest ethnic groups. Uh, Ger is, is a new heir, which is the second biggest one. <laughs> and Dinka is the, is the predominant one, the, the ethnic group of the president. And that was a big, that was part of the source of the tension in the civil war that going back decades and then it happened again in 2013. Um, in the U.S., what's it like? Are, are, are South Sudanese divided along the same lines or are they more, does that matter less once you leave South Sudan? Hey, I think the social fabrics of our society is, is being damaged by the current civil war. 
and that happened in 2013 uh, because it, it took shape in a, in a tribal lines, you know, and many, many people don't, 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 look, don't look at each other in the eye because we lost a lot of our family. Even we, the diaspora community who came to here in the 90s, went back to really give a helping hand. Most of those guys, they didn't make it back, you know. And that made everybody become very bitter. And um, I don't think the problem is between the Dinka and the Nuer. I think it's the problem is we, we have a leadership crisis in our country uh, and that could really capture the spirit of the people and, uh, and, and try to build a nation that can be, uh, that can help other community within East Africa. Uh, but we haven't find a person that really captured that that spirit of the people, because people of South Sudan are very, very nice people by nature, whether the Dinka or the Nuer, you know, we, we all the same people at the end of the day. You know, the similarity in our culture, we have similar cultures, similar everything. And we all intermarry to each other. We all related it somehow. Um, I think there will be a time where this, this conflict will come to an end and uh, the new generation will really take the country where we can push something that has to do with the, with, with the national, uh, with, the, with the symbol of nationality, you know, in the state of we had to identify ourselves, you from the Nuer, you from the Dinka, you know, we don't have to exploit that a lot. It's not important. Being a Nuer and being a Dinka is, should not be a problem. We should actually enjoy, you know, our little differences because we have rich culture. You know, I can't even imagine to live in a country where the Dinka are not there or, or dancing and singing in Dinka. It's a culture that I enjoy. And if you've been to South Sudan, you've seen people dancing in groups. And then when we were a child soldier too, that's how we used to do. We used to dance in Nuer, we dance in Dinka, we dance in Burle, we dance in Anyo, we and all those tribes and then uh, we, we, we have a motivation to do, to build our nation as, as one people. Our division is not what should guide us to have a nation. What do you think people outside South Sudan can do to help? Oh, there's so many things. Uh, people from outside South Sudan that they can, they, they can do to help. Um, and I think a lot of organizations they are out there on the ground and then they are they are helping, you know, already. And now, uh, oh, but people of South Sudan they really need help. Look, uh, uh, we have plenty of IDPs in every corner of South Sudan. They believe in their children who are born and uh, and raised in in IDP camps. And we have millions of refugees who are living in. Kenya, in Kakuma, Uganda, Etan, in Ethiopia, millions of us, we are outside the country. So that means there's a problem. So, you know, the, help, the help is much needed because we don't have a security in every corner. It's a lot of uh, tribal fights right now. And in Jongole, where I come from, is a very intense place. And uh, in the greater Bargazal, people are fighting among each other. And, then we need help. We need help, you know. Well, Gare, I think um, we're sort of reaching reaching the, the end of, of this. We're, there's going to be a, a VIP room after this talk. Um, okay. I'm going to jump off, but but I, I just want to let you know your book is your book is really beautiful. Thank and, you. And I've read I've read a lot about the the region, and I've read other stories about lost boys and and kids who came to the U.S. and made something of themselves. And I really felt that yours was especially honest um, and that you just, I don't know, you stayed true to yourself and, and you struggled and it was, yeah, it was really inspiring. Like it was a really inspiring story and it was told. I know this book is geared towards a, a, young, a young adult audience, but if you took that label off of it, you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't know the difference. I mean, it's a very introspective, sophisticated, um, an informative book that that just deals with what's you know on the you know what you were dealing with internally 
it's not just about action and drama. It's about somebody thinking through how to, how to survive and how to make a life for themselves in a very different place. And you talk about refugees, you know, always having to reinvent themselves. And I had recently read this book, Exit West, which is, a, which is an amazing novel about, about refugees. Um, and, and it's th that idea that you're just constantly trying to survive in a new place. Um, so I just want to thank you. I would love to talk to you more at, at some later date and congrats on, on producing a beautiful book. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff, man. I really, I really enjoy speaking with you and, and I hope we will talk some more. Thanks. Thanks for your My time pleasure. And, and everything you guys. Thank you, Gare and Jeffrey. I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Jeffrey, with your assessment of, of Gare's memoir. Um, just a few a reminder as we close the program um, that you can buy a copy of Walk Toward the Rising Sun Through Politics and Prose. We'll drop that uh, purchase link into the chat again. This is for the online purchase. Um, and again, it's also not too late to join us for the special VIP meet and greet after this event. Um, and we'll, we'll, um, you can join by registering through the same Eventbrite link that you use to join this event um, by clicking on the add on a special VIP meet and greet. But we'll also uh, you know, put that, into the, that link into the chat once again. Um, so I think without uh, further ado, a huge thanks to Gare and Jeffrey for this amazing conversation. Um, and a big thanks to the audience um, for joining us today. Uh, I wish everyone that they stay healthy, safe, and well-read. Um, goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. Margaret.